This BYU Forum address with Scott Springer was given on July 15th, 2014. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you here this morning for today's Forum Assembly. My name is Brent Webb, and President Worthen has asked me to conduct the Forum today. Today we're delighted to hear from Scott Springer, an Associate Dean in the College of Humanities. We welcome his wife, Anka, who is seated on the stand with him. We also welcome family and friends of the Springers to the Forum today. Dr. Springer's talk is entitled, When the Humanities Become the World. Scott Springer is professor of, professor of French Studies and Associate Dean in the College of Humanities. He holds graduate degrees in French from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University and Emory University. He was the recipient of a Fulbright Scholar Award at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris in 2009 and has held an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at UCLA. He is currently a reviewer for several journals, serves on the editorial board of a French university press, and is a member of two research teams in Paris. Dr. Springer is the author of two books, one forthcoming, over 30 peer-reviewed journal articles, and several edited volumes, most of which are on modern French literature and culture. As an administrator, Dr. Springer coordinates the French graduate program. He directed the European Studies program from 2006 to 2009 and has been on the executive committee of a Title VI Center for the Study of Europe since 2003. As an associate dean, he helped create and develop the Humanities Plus program, whose aim is to bridge the humanities and liberal arts with global career opportunities. Dr. Springer was recently appointed, appointed Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs at the American University of Paris, and sadly, he will be leaving BYU to step into this new position on September 1st. He is an avid reader of disciplines outside his field and enjoys skiing and road cycling. He and his wife, Anka, have a 16-year-old daughter. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Springer. Good morning, and thank you very much for coming. I'm actually surprised to see so many people here today. And thank you, Brent Webb, for the generous introduction. I'm delighted to have the honor to give today's BYU Forum speech. It's a little unconventional, but since I'm essentially retiring from BYU next month, I'd like to take a moment to express my sincere thanks to you for attending my retirement party. <laughs> Thanks to the BYU community for its incredibly warm and generous support over the past 21 years. I'd also like to express my gratitude to a couple of individuals in particular who took a chance on me to get me hired and to advance my career here. Madison Sowell, my first chair and who's actually in attendance here, deserves special thanks for convincing me to leave Washington DC for Provo and for expertly shepherding me through BYU's hiring gauntlet. Anybody who's been hired as a professor knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'd also like to acknowledge my friends and colleagues in the College of Humanities, the Center for the Study of Europe, and the Kennedy Center for International Studies for their friendship and support. I'd like above all to thank John Rosenberg for the tremendous opportunity to work with and learn from him and my other colleagues in the Dean's Office. It's been an amazing ride these past few years. Now I said take a chance on me a second ago because in order to provide context for my remarks today, I think it's worth mentioning up front that I'm not a member of the LDS Church. This surprising fact has been exposed in a number of amusing ways over the years. In the beginning, of course, I was confused by a number of unfamiliar references, food items, and local vocabulary, ward, stake, home teacher, general authority, funeral potatoes. <laughs> oh my heck, and <laughs> other various Utah swear words. <laughs> I'd often overhear conversations. I had no idea what people were saying. I knew it was English. That's it. I also often mispronounced common Mormon names or cities, which was, of course, a dead giveaway. Such mistakes and misunderstandings diminished over time, but they do still happen. Typically, though, the exposure now occurs when people inquire about my ability in French, which is followed by the inevitable, did you serve a mission in France? 
or more confidently, in which French-speaking mission did you serve? <laughs> Students, as you can imagine, are always surprised to learn, sometimes deep into the semester, that their professor is not a member. The revelation often generates a number of interesting questions, which can be boiled down to something like this. So how is it that um, you're at BYU? <laughs> which is the polite version of one student's unforgettable question a number of years ago. You're not LDS, so what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Let me hasten to say, students' questions have always been motivated by curiosity or puzzlement. I have never in 21 years felt unwelcome. On the contrary, I even joke with my non-Mormon friends outside of Utah that I have, by osmosis, become at least half Mormon in disposition and outlook. I'm pretty sure that I'm a lot nicer than I used to be. Or at least I'm much less cynical. I have a better sense of what it means to live in a real community. I have also learned an enormous amount about organization and leadership by working under some truly magnificent leaders. So a lot of really positive things have rubbed off on me in 20 years. I was asked to do this forum speech before the administration knew of my departure. So now that I'm leaving, I thought I might use this student's funny question, so what the heck are you doing here, as a segue into the topic I originally planned about the humanities. So here I've prepared a top five list, my, my top five list of the most awesome and memorable things about BYU for a non-Mormon like me. Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not going to find these in Paris. <laughs> I initially, I know this is a bit blasphemous, did not take to these overly sweet and gooey things when I, was, when I first arrived. But after dozens of graduations, meetings, and retirement gatherings, maybe Bryn has some lined up for us after this, where there was nothing else to eat, I slowly developed a taste for the iconic mint brownie. I have to confess, I never did acquire a taste for the Y sparkle. Okay, so the real number five, the setting. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but I think it's worth saying, reminding ourselves of this incredible setting, the campus, the JFSB building, and especially the mountains. They're absolutely spectacular. I've spent a lot of time skiing in those mountains and more recently cycling with friends on campus. I got it in. I've become deeply attached to this geographical setting and I know I will miss it. Colleagues in French and Italian, but also across campus. As associate dean and also as director of uh, European studies, I was able to meet colleagues from across campus and I've developed a deep affection and respect for them. I could go on for hours, but I only have a few minutes. Number three, BYU's mission. And by that I mean the requirement to consider the secular in light of the religious. Now this would seem to be a bit of a paradox for a non-Mormon, but this requirement, I have to say looking back, has been deeply influential on my teaching, my course offerings, my research, and me. And that's no exaggeration. I learned about the teaching mission by failing at it miserably. It's actually a little surprising, but nobody told me before they sent me into the classroom that I would be evaluated for such things like being spiritually inspiring or bringing gospel insights to the subject matter, even to French grammar. I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> I'll never forget reading my first set of teaching evaluations. Classroom management, teacher competency, etc., were actually quite good but I had big black dots, these were the old paper evaluations, down the left side of the column on spiritual matters. The spirit had decidedly not made an appearance in French 202 that semester. <laughs> of course, I eventually translated this requirement into terms that made sense for me. My approach became, over time, simply caring as deeply as possible about my students, their learning, and their futures. And this seemed to work out okay. I'm still here. <laughs> the flip side of the BYU mission, research, was much easier and even fortuitous for me because my graduate work focused on religion and literature at a time when religion was pretty much a taboo topic in the academy and especially in the context of French studies. In the meantime, religion has become a hot topic 
opening doors to the Mellon Postdoc at UCLA, the Fulbright, and several prestigious publications. For me, the religious uh, focus of BYU's mission has thus been an entirely unexpected source of my academic freedom and flourishing. I really cannot overstate how lucky and grateful I am for my employment here. Number two, again, no mystery. This is a classroom in Amman, Jordan. Bilingualism and biculturalism. I have my own personal take on this that I'll return to in a moment. Number one, again, not really a mystery. The students, the amazing students. This is a shot from a study abroad recently. I will clearly miss them more than anything or anything from my time here. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But I understood the minute that I stepped foot on campus that BYU is the most unique academic community in the United States, if not in the entire world, because of its students and the incredible gift of the overseas mission experience. I will never forget the 20th century French lit class that I guest taught for Norm Turner during the interview process. The class was bursting at the seams with smart, energetic, and curious students, and the foreign language ability was simply off the charts. It was clear to me immediately that BYU students were positioned for success in the international arena in ways that no other university, not even the Ivies, could ever match. In every one of my positions, as professor in the classroom, as director of study abroad, as European studies coordinator, and now as associate dean, I've always tried to cultivate the incredible linguistic talents of BYU students and to align them with the best available international opportunities. Okay, so I want to shift gears here and talk about the state of the humanities in the U.S. and BYU's position in them. If you read the news, or even if you don't, you've probably come across more than a few articles recently on the decline or the crisis of the humanities. There has been a lot of speculation and hand-wringing of late on this topic. As you can see from these recent book titles, from Blow Up the Humanities, Not for Profit, Remaking College, we find a number of different approaches to the so-called so humanities crisis. And this is just a small index of the wealth of books out there on this topic. Some want simply to abolish them. Some are nostalgic. Others are idealistic. Still others, like the contributors to Remaking College, are sincerely trying to figure out practical ways to adapt the humanities for the contemporary world. This the national discussion on the humanities has been going on for a long, long time. Reference to a crisis goes back to the 1920s. There was a spike in the 60s, analyzed famously by G.H. Plum. And you can see the book cover there. You can tell how old it is by the cover. And another huge spike in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Last summer, however, we reached an all-time high in negative commentary, largely because of two reports. The Harvard report on the left and the heart of the matter, a gigantic report on the state of the humanities and social sciences conducted by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on the right. Both studies address the recent and dramatic decline in humanities students in American universities. To give you an idea, there has been a 35% loss of students at Harvard between 2006 and 2012 in the humanities college. Both reports speculate on possible causes and solutions to the problem. But neither, in my view, is very convincing. A lot of generalities and bromides, and they do not address student or parental concerns about the relevance of the humanities for career opportunity, which is what is on most students and tuition-paying parents' minds, evidently even at Harvard. I do prefer the heart of the matter, I should say, because it mentions three universities with the most highly innovative approaches to the humanities in the US. And those are Princeton, Chicago, and yes, BYU. So what are the, what are the main sources of the problem? What are the pressures on, on universities and liberal arts colleges and, and colleges of humanities? Obviously, one of the big problems is cost, or ROI, return on investment. College is getting very expensive. The job market is tight. This translates into 90% of students focusing on college as career preparation. We in the humanities traditionally don't look at what we do that way. So there's a perceived disconnect between humanities and careers, and this is tied to what I call a language or a narrative problem. We simply do not know how to talk about our disciplines in ways that are relevant to career concerns. 
The third point would be, and there are many more than this, a lack of a globalizing and professional strategy. Often, career services don't understand the humanities, and thus they don't know how to align students with opportunity beyond the most obvious ones. The biggest problem, frankly, to boil it all down, is the contradiction between the idea that college is career prep and the perception, or I should say misperception, that the humanities have no role to play in that. Now, the student's um, approach to career prep is to think about it in terms of the major. This is natural. We all focus on it. And they often pick their major by the name of the profession embedded in the major's name. Education, educator, accounting, accountant, nursing, nurse, and so on. The choice seems to provide a clear pathway to a successful career. Now, obviously, choosing a major is important. But in my view, there is an overemphasis on the major to the exclusion of other skills and capacities currently required by the marketplace. Major thinking also has, as a byproduct, a checklist approach to everything else, such as general education or coursework in the humanities and the arts. The entire purpose of general education and the humanities and the arts is to provide a broad foundation for different modes of inquiry for innovative thinking. It is not something to get out of the way. So students stop thinking about general education as getting something over with. So where do the humanities fit into career thinking? Since our name doesn't align with a profession. The question really is what are they and where do they lead? Many students and parents simply have no idea. So to remedy that, our humanities lab team decided to gather alumni data over about a decade and translate that information visually. And this is what it looks like. I should explain, on the left, you have the humanities majors, which are English, all the foreign languages, linguistics, philosophy. And on the right, you have the careers as defined by the US Labor Department. And in between, you have that spaghetti mess. Three things, there are three things that we can learn from this image, I think. One is that despite popular mythology, humanities degrees lead to any number of careers. Two, there are some predictable pathways, education, law. The humanities are a great preparation for professional school, including medicine. But also, business, management, communications, marketing, IT, etc. Our majors go basically everywhere. So what is it that employers value? This question, curiously, is almost never asked by people studying the humanities and where our students go. I think some people find it crass. We're not supposed to be about that. And, or they assume they know in advance and pull their arguments out of their hats. If BYU's approach has been at all innovative, it's because we listen to the employer's perspective. And what do we learn? Well, here's an interesting fact for all students. 70% of the labor market wants a combination of skills, disciplines, and experiences. The key words here are interdisciplinarity and hybridity. This is good news for humanities majors not going on for graduate study. It means that you can study the humanities as long as you combine them with coursework in some technical field. But the opposite is also true. Business, tech, and vocational majors shouldn't be sitting on their laurels. They also need to combine their training with other disciplines, especially when thinking about long-term career opportunity. The point is to think about your undergraduate, undergraduate education holistically and not just as a narrow specialization. Another interesting fact, 35% of all hiring of recent college graduates is major independent. That's a huge number. What this means is that the undeclared or those deferring their choice, thinking that the major is the ticket to success, are perhaps wasting time. To be sure, if you want a specific profession, like engineering or nursing or architecture, then obviously you need that major. But for about one third of the jobs, the major simply is not that important. If you look at data on CEOs across the country, an inordinate number of them come from um, liberal arts colleges as their undergraduate degree. Another study cited in the Wall Street Journal says the same thing. On a scale of one to 100, one to 100, the top priority for employers is not the major or even your college's reputation. It's internships and experience. This is followed up by another shocking fact. 
Less than half of managers find recent grads prepared for work. Now, it's true, as colleagues often remind me, universities are not trade schools. But clearly, there's something wrong. This, side, this slide begs the question, what exactly is missing? Well, what is missing are the essential skills, those required by a majority of employers. The gap comes from universities not teaching these things, or not explicitly, and employers no longer wanting to do on-the-job training. There's no time to go through the whole list here, but you can see that many of these traits and skills can actually be identified and cultivated in almost any major, even in the humanities. We just need to help students see and extract these skills in what we're already doing, maybe even through learning outcomes. Analyze and interpret information, communicate persuasively using data and analysis, engage in continuous learning. This is a, this is a much needed skill today. Initiative. This is more of a character trait, and it's often missing uh, in students as they enter the marketplace. I've underscored the last one, um, which I think is BYU's true competitive advantage. Understand the impact of a company or organization in a global setting. This is highly valued today. So how do we know this? Well, two ways. Scientific analysis of survey data and anecdotal evidence from the marketplace. Siri a labor research institute at Michigan State University run by Dr. Phil Gardner focuses almost exclusively on college students entering the marketplace. He can tell you what the hot degrees are, what the hiring trends are, et cetera. He analyzes data based on annual surveys of around 5,000 companies from Fortune 100 uh, to small businesses. After years of conducting such research, he has come to this conclusion. I can boil down years and years of reports to one sentence. There are really only two choices for graduates wanting a lot of options. To be a technically savvy liberal arts graduate or a liberally educated technical graduate. Liberal, liberal has no political connotation in this uh, context, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Again, the key concept here is hybridity. Market evidence. There's also tons of market evidence demonstrating that nearly every sector of the economy finds value in the humanities and liberal arts. Here's a screenshot of the Humanities Plus blog that I've curated for the last five years. In it are all the anecdotes you need to feel confident about the importance of the humanities for the marketplace. Students who are hesitant or parents who are skeptical about the value of the humanities should really take a close look at this information. I'm just going to run through a few quick quotes that you can read on your own. So given this configuration of facts about the current global marketplace, we in the College of Humanities have developed a couple of initiatives for leveraging what we believe to be our students' competitive advantage. The names we have given to these initiatives are Humanities Plus and Plus Humanities. In Humanities Plus, humanities disciplines remain the center of gravity, but we encourage students to supplement their study with technical coursework, mentored research, re leadership roles, and above all, internship experiences. With Plus Humanities, we want faculty and students across campus to see us as a valuable resource not only for professionalizing foreign language skills, but also for cultivating the crucial skills of writing, textual analysis, historical insight, and cross-cultural thinking. So our approach to launching these initiatives has been primarily as an advising strategy. We did this by combining academic and career advising within our college's advising center. The point is to build in career thinking and habits from the outset, from the moment students declare the major. This process can be illustrated visually. This is what I'm calling old school advising. In the past, students basically would cruise through their four, sometimes five years at BYU, and then come into the advising office for career advice somewhere around graduation time, which is obviously way, way, way too late. Many of the crucial steps and experiences must be acquired before the senior year. Humanities plus advising, is a continuous process. We want to get information to students so that they can devise a plan early and begin doing stuff that counts, 
whether it's for a career or for graduate school. So this begs the question, what counts? The bubbles in this slide represent the relative importance of the most valuable supplemental experiences or activities. Based on survey data, you can see that the internship is the single most important supplement. 89% of employers say that it is required for employment. At BYU, we would modify that. This is a national survey, or based on a national survey, we would put international internships. But obviously, stateside internships are valuable as well, leadership, mentored research, and so on. The big question for me, especially as somebody whose life was deeply influenced by my study abroad experience, why is study abroad, I don't know if you can see that out there, but study abroad is at the bottom of the list. This seems to be counterintuitive in a global context. Um, and as I looked into it, again, this is a national survey. This has no particular reflection on BYU. Um, but I think it's interesting because it might have spillover effects. One is bad design. A lot of the study abroads are guided tourism and employers just do not see the relevance of this. You can imagine in a job interview, the employer says, so what did you learn on your study abroad? How was your study abroad? And the student is floundering around and says something like, it's awesome, or uh, we saw a lot of castles, or something like that. It just doesn't resonate very well with employers. So the second part of that then is students don't know how to talk about study abroad in ways that resonate. They actually need to be trained. So we have actually been trying to develop pre and post um, training for students so they can talk about this in a, in a more convincing way. The other thing, obviously, that's important for us is, um, given the importance of the internship, is to put focus on the global internships. And we have done this financially and intellectually. We have in international internship programs in every department, from English to Japanese, French, Spanish, Russian, et cetera. Our college has a substantial presence overseas. We have, in fact, grown from 3 to 25% student participation over the past five years, and we'd really like to get it up to. 50%. We've also discovered on-campus internships. Students, if you don't know about this particular resource, learn about it. It's an amazing resource. You can work for top-shelf companies using your international skills and language skills right here on the BYU campus. And there is also, this is uh, incipient, but there's also some faculty supervised consulting, um, research for organizations, um, and even for the State Department. State, the State Department has some on-campus internships that are quite interesting. Um, so our focus also has a little bit of pressure on curriculum that we've been working on. We've been engaged in intercollege collaboration, mainly with um, business, but also engineering. We've encouraged students, our students, to minor outside of our college, for example, in international development, in international business. And the Marriott School developed a certificate for our students called the Global Management and Literacy Certificate. This is a very valuable certificate for our students. We also encourage hybridity of skills via minors, and I shouldn't say this, but sometimes double major, majors where they're appropriate. And language certificates. Um, I said that the rest of the campus should see us as a resource. The big source of that is language certificates. So students in professional schools, in business and engineering, um, can come and professionalize their language skills and have that certified by us. I want to close um, my talk today with reference to an industry that is, in my view, perfectly suited for BYU humanities students, and that is the language services industry. It is currently valued at $32 billion annually and is rapidly growing. While in attendance at the GALA, GALA stands for Globalization and Localization Association, it's the major language services association in the world, I attended a conference in Istanbul, Turkey um, in the spring. BYU was the only educational institution present. Me, my assistant dean and I were accosted by dozens of employers looking for what they call global talent. Evidently, BYU has global talent. They assured me that they would love to hire our students. We don't necessarily have programs in this, but this is something that we could work on. And in any case, it gives me confidence that there is a marketplace for our students. So returning to the opening slide, um, the title is obviously a bit of an exaggeration, but I think it captures something very real about the convergence of the humanities and the humanities particularly at BYU and global trends. Most of the world's major problems to be solved and opportunities to be had depend and will increasingly depend on innovative, supple thinkers who can negotiate disciplinary, cultural, and linguistic divides. From my perspective, 
If BYU students are not the most suited for this contemporary challenge, I really have no idea who could be. Thank you. This BYU Forum address with Scott Springer was given on July 15, 2014.